Yeah. Revenge of the Lawn. Um, when I was a little girl, my dad was an English teacher. And so I grew up in a house full of books. And not only did he read to me when I was a little girl, but he kept on reading to me when I was growing up. And so when I was about 13, dad brought home this book. I mean, this is a little tall. Yeah. He brought home a book and we read it together. He read it to me. I, we both laughed our whole so And so this is a short story called Revenge of the Lawn. And it's by a man named Richard Brodigan. And he was a West Coast author, kind of in between the beats and the hippies. Uh, this is a crazy story. My grandmother, in her own way, shines like a beacon down the stormy American past. She was a bootlegger in a little county up in the state of Washington. She was also a handsome woman, close to six feet tall, who carried 190 pounds in the grand operatic manner in the, of the early 1900s. And her specialty was bourbon, a little raw, but a welcomed refreshment in those Volstead Act days of prohibition. She, of course, was no female Al Capone, but her bootlegging feats were the cornucopia of legend in her neck of the woods, as they say. She had the county in her pocket for years. The sheriff used to call her up every morning and give her the weather report and tell her how the chickens were laying. I can imagine her talking to the sheriff. Well, sheriff, I hope your mother gets better soon. I had a cold and a bad sore throat last week myself. I've still got the sniffles. Tell her hello for me and to drop by the next time she's down this way. And if you want that case, you can pick it up or I can have it sent over as soon as Jack gets back with the car. No, I don't know if I'm going to the fireman's ball this year, but you know that my heart is with the fireman. If you don't see me there tonight, you tell the boys that. No, uh, I'll try to get there, but I'm still not fully recovered from my cold. It kind of climbs on me in the evening. My grandmother lived in a three-story house that was old even in those days. There was a pear tree in the front yard which was heavily eroded by rain from years of not having any lawn. The picket fence that once enclosed the lawn was gone, too, and people just drove their cars right up to the porch. In the winter, the front yard was a mud hole, and in summer, it was hard as a rock. Jack used to curse the front yard as if it were a living thing. He was the man who lived with my grandmother for 30 years. He was not my grandfather, but an Italian who came down the road one day selling lots in Florida. He was selling a vision of eternal oranges and sunshine door to door in a land where people ate apples and it rained a lot. Jack stopped at my grandmother's house to sell her a lot just a stone's throw from downtown Miami and he was delivering her whiskey a week later. He stayed for 30 years and Florida went on without him. Jack hated the front yard because he thought it was against him. There had been a beautiful lawn there when Jack came along, but he, he could let it wander off into nothing. He refused to water it or take care of it in any way. Now the ground was so hard it gave his car flat tires in the summer. The yard was always finding a nail to put in one of his tires, or the car was always sinking out of sight in the winter when the rains came out. The lawn belonged to my grandfather, who lived out the end of his life in an insane asylum. It had been his pride and joy, and was said to be the place where his powers came from. My grandfather was a minor Washington mystic who, in 1911, prophesied the exact date when World War I would start, June 28, 1914. But it had been too much for him. He never got to enjoy the fruit of his labor because they had to put him away in 1913, and he spent 17 years in the state insane asylum, believing he was a child, and it was actually May 3, 1872. He believed that he was six years old, and it was a cloudy day about to rain, and his mother was baking a chocolate cake. It stayed May 3, 1872 for my grandfather until he died in 1930. It took 17 years for that chocolate cake to be baked. There was a photograph of my grandfather. I look a great deal like him, the only difference being that I am over six feet tall and he was not quite five feet tall. He had a dark idea that being so short, so close to the earth and his lawn would help to prophesy the exact date when World War I would start. It was a shame that the war started without him. If only he could have held back his childhood for another year, avoided that chocolate cake, all of his dreams would have come true. <laughs> there were always two large dents in my grandmother's house that had never been repaired, and one of them came about this way. In the autumn, the pears would get ripe on the tree in the front yard, and the pears would fall on the ground and rot, <clears throat> and bees would gather by the hundreds to swarm on them. The bees, somewhere along the line, had picked up the habit of stinging Jack two or three times a year. They would string him, sting him in the most ingenious ways. Once a bee got in his wallet, and he went down to the store to buy some food for dinner, not knowing the mischief that he carried in his pocket. He took out his wallet to pay for the food. That'll be 72 cents, the grocer said. Ah! Jack said, looking down to see a bee busy stinging him on the little finger. 
The first large dent in the house was brought about by still another bee landing on Jack's cigar as he was driving the car into the front yard that pair had got in the stock market crash. The bee ran down the cigar. Jack could only stare at it cross-eyed in terror and it stung him on the upper lip. His reaction to this was to drive the car immediately into the house. <laughs> that front yard had a history after Jack let the lawn go to hell. One day in 1932, Jack was off running an errand or delivering something for my grandmother, and she wanted to dump the old mash for making the bootleg and get a new batch going. Because Jack was gone, she decided to do it herself. Grandmother put on a pair of railroad overalls that she used for working around the still, filled a wheelbarrow with mash, and dumped it out in the front yard. She had a flock of snow-white geese that roamed outside the house and nested in the garage that had not been used to park the car since the time Jack had come along selling futures in Florida. Jack had some kind of idea that it was all wrong for a car to have a house. I think it was something he had learned in the old country. The answer was in Italian, because that was the only language Jack used when he talked about the garage. For everything else, he used English, but it was only Italian for the garage. After grandmother had dumped the mash on the ground near the pear tree, she went back to the still down in the basement, and the geeks all gathered around the mash and started talking it over. I guess they came to a mutually agreeable decision because they all started eating the mash, as they ate the mash, their eyes got brighter and brighter, and their voices, in appreciation of the mash, got louder and louder, because they were getting drunk. After a while, one of the geese stuck his head in the mash and forgot to take it out. Another one of the geese gackled madly, tried to stand on one leg and give a W.C. Fields imitation of a stork. He maintained that position for about a minute before he fell on his tail feathers. My grandmother found them all lying around the mash in the positions that they had fallen. <laughs> they looked as if they had been machine gunned. From the height of her operatic splendor, she thought they were all dead. She responded to this by plucking all their feathers and piling, piling their bald bodies in the wheelbarrow, wheeling them down to the basement. She had to make five trips to accommodate them. She stuck them like cordwood near the still and waited for Jack to return and dispose of them in a way that would provide a goose for dinner and a small profit by selling the rest of the flock in town. She went upstairs to take a nap after finishing with the still. <clears throat> It was about an hour later that the geese woke up. They had devastating hangovers. They all kind of gathered themselves uselessly to their feet when suddenly one of the geese noticed that he did not have any feathers. He informed the other geese of their condition, too. They were all in despair. They paraded out of the basement in a forlorn and wobbly gang, and they were all standing in a cluster near the pear tree when Jack drove into the front yard. The memory of the time he had been stung on the mouth by that bee must have come back to his mind when he saw the dee-feathered geese standing there, because suddenly, like a madman, he tore out the cigar he had stuck in his mouth and threw it away from him as hard as he could. This caused his hand to travel through the windshield, a feat that cost him 32 stitches. The geese stood by, staring on like some helpless, primitive American advertisement for aspirin under the pear tree as Jack drove his car into the house for the second and last time in the 20th century. The first time I remember anything in life occurred in my grandmother's front yard. The year was either 1936 or 1937. I remember a man, probably Jack, cutting down the pear tree and soaking it with kerosene. It looked really strange, even for a first memory of life, to watch a man pour gallons and gallons of kerosene all over a tree lying stretched out 30 feet or so on the ground and then set fire to it while the fruit was still green on the branches. Richard Brody. <laughs>